Oh, what Bible verse? Oh, I'm going to be in 1 John chapter 1. (laughs) Praise the Lord. But anyway, well, well, look, the prayers were answered because I was very healthy and I feel good and I didn't come back just just destroyed. (laughs) And, uh, you know, it is brutal getting in and out of little cars and little beds and little planes, you know. (laughs) Believe me, being a big dude is not all it's cracked up to be. (laughs) But big dude don't get a break these days. But anyway, God gives us all the breaks we need, so... Look, I preached the word. Everywhere I went, I preached the word. And one of the things, it was my spiritual warfare, uh, War on the Saints tour, because I wrote a book, it's already been published there, and I'm going to bring it out here within the next month, called War on the Saints. And everywhere I went, I talked about the war, the spiritual war, how to understand what's going on, how to see what Satan's actually, his tactics are, and the principles for us to, to get the victory. I also talked everywhere I went, almost everywhere, about the story of the creation of man and woman in Genesis. And one of the reasons why is because the spirit of Antichrist is seriously on the offensive, confusing especially young people as to the very, very basic things such as the gender. I mean, I was just told uh, by uh, Jamie Northrup that there's a school in England, I just came back from England, it doesn't surprise me, where 17 kids in an elementary school wanted to change their gender. Now, who's messing with their minds? Who is destroying these people? Because believe me, there's nothing cute or funny about it. This is the absolute destruction of a person. If you get your gender and your very identity questioned by a bunch of fruitcakes. It used to be there was adults in charge. And by that, I mean there was institutions in our society that would actually protect children, protect people, stand up for what's right, whether they were Christian or not. I mean, it's just it's insane to think that transvestites could come into a school and teach children but not anymore now that's common uh, things and now there's going to be held pay because this has never been done before and they have no idea what they're unleashing there anytime you get uh, well for one thing the Lord is going to judge us terribly there's several scriptures about millstones if you make one of these little ones a stumble it'd be better for you to hang a millstone around your neck thrown into the lake what if a society does what if a whole generation does what if a bunch of a society just goes crazy, liberal, throws out everything that God gave them and starts messing with kids' minds? That's our society. That's what we're doing right now. So I was preaching because I believe that there's a way back. You know, there's a, there's a Bible story about a man naked and running around the tombs and hitting himself with stones. And one day I was reading that and I said, that's our generation. That's these kids nowadays. They're, they're tormented. They're oppressed because they've been messed with and they've been propagandized for evil. And where does it leave them? They're obsessed with death and they hurt themselves. But the end of the story is good because it says Jesus came and at the end they were clo- he was clothed and in his right mind. And that's what I pray for this generation. The kids could get the right mind, get their head on straight. And, and the, the thing is, the adults have left the room, okay? Every institution, you know, medicine, psych, so-called psychology, education, they all just cave into this. There's only one group left on earth that has a way out. That's the true church. But who's going to listen to us? See, that's the thing. But we do have a way out, and it's not rocket science. What I, what I got from God is share Genesis 2 everywhere you go. Because the answer is in Genesis 2. The, the, the very simple answer is in the creation of man and yes. woman. They're not interchangeable. No. They didn't happen the same way. Man and woman are different from all the rest of creation. Everything else God created, he just spoke with his mouth. But when he made man, man is different. He got down in the dirt. The Most High took his hands and created a body. And then the holy God bent over the body that he had formed and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Man is special. And God was intimate with us. He didn't just speak us into being. He got his hands dirty. And if man is special, then what's woman? Even more special. Her creation is totally different. He put the man into a deep sleep and took out his side. If man is refined dirt, what is woman? 
refined, refined dirt. Woman is special. She too is the image of God. Male and female, the image of God. See, this generation has forgotten that. They think they're interchangeable because of the perverts that they've allowed in to, to educate people. I'm telling you, there's going to be hell to pay for doing this. The people that did this are going to answer to God. I know why there's a hot hell. You take a little child and confuse them on this level, you're going to go to hell. And anyone that supports it is going to go with you. He made the woman out of the sight of the man. He brings the man out of the deep sleep. It's a lot like death and resurrection, isn't it? And the man sees a woman and his mind's not fallen. It's not cluttered by sin. He's not confused. So he begins to prophesy. He says, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. And he saw all the way to the end of time because his eye had not been dimmed by the fall yet. And he saw that his wedding pointed to the ultimate wedding. See, that's what I told him all over Ireland and England. The Bible begins with the wedding, ends with the wedding. Amen. The last wedding is a man with a hole in his side too. We know that man, the ultimate groom, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And there is a bride that he will be joined to soon. For he's told us in the golden passage, I go to prepare a place for you. And where I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am there, you may be with me. Then Jesus told us that, and that's the speech a Jewish bridegroom makes when he's engaging a woman after he's talked to her father. I go to prepare a place for you. I'm coming again to receive you unto myself. How many are glad Jesus is coming? Amen. So I told him that, and I said, look, this is our, our narrative. It's the right one. And it's the way back. Oh, to be so confused on that level. It's just, <laughs> it's criminal what they've done. It's criminal. And God will make them answer for this. To allow perverts in for story time. And to confuse children on their very gender. There is coming a terrible judgment to this world. But there's only one group left. Why are we still here? To bear witness to the truth. What truth? That one truth that the spirit of Antichrist seems to be contesting. That's the truth. That's where I want to be. So anyway... I preached repentance. I preached a lot of Bible prophecy. I showed them in Ireland, man, they were stunned. They don't get that much. And I told them, man, I took several passages and said, you want to know what your world looks like today? Look at Isaiah. Look at Joel. Look at Ezekiel. They're describing your world, and they were 3,000 years ago. How did they do that? By the Spirit of God. This is what I did. And I bought a bunch of my books over there because they're published. And I took them everywhere I go, and people couldn't get enough of them. I don't charge a whole lot. I'm not a businessman. People could not get enough of them because <clears throat> they're hungry for truth. And my books are nothing spectacular. My new book is only 100 pages. I don't want to rewrite every book that's ever been written on the subject. I just have one insight that I wanted to share. And I'll bring that out within the next month here, too. So uh, thank you for your prayers. I, by my standards, it was a tremendous trip. It was Full of the Holy Ghost, the people were touched and moved, and I prayed with a lot of people on an individual basis, and counseled with people, and evangelized people. It was just fantastic. Uh, but it was a blur, too, because I was probably slept in about 18 beds. All right. <laughs> um, go to the uh, First John. I want to talk about something very, very important, but very, very simple. But that's all right, because my heart is for people that are new to the faith. I want to teach you what I found helpful and important from the beginning of my Christian life. Christianity demands teaching. You've got to grow. You've got to continue on. And you can never assume you know everything. You've got to always have a teachable spirit. Now, what I want to talk about today is the subject of the precious blood of Jesus Christ. The precious blood of Jesus Christ. Now, when I first came into Christianity, one of the things that was remarkable to me, and I just couldn't figure it out for a while, that all the so a lot of the songs at the Assembly of God, are you washed in the blood? Is your soul spotless? Is it white as snow? Are you washed in the blood? Or the blood shall never lose its power. I mean, there was so much about the blood. And people would sing about the blood, and they'd pray about the blood. And I just couldn't 
figure out what it was. It takes light. It takes revelation. But then the Lord taught me, and I'd like to share that. Okay, 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. If we walk in the light... Verse 7, if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. The only condition, the only precondition for fellowship with God is a willingness to walk in the light. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be spotless. You can be pretty messed up. God will have fellowship with you if you're willing to come into the light. The light means the light of exposure. I'm willing to be known as for who I am, what I've done. No pretense. That is the only precondition. And he says, if you'll do that, if you'll walk in the light as he in the light, we'll have fellowship with each other. One of the things that break, break, broke up our fellowship earlier was darkness. And that's another subject for another time of people living in darkness. Holding things in, resentments, bitterness. You can't go on. Sooner or later, it, all get, it gets, blows up. Okay. But then he says, the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse us from each and every sin. If we say we haven't sinned, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. There is your darkness for you. I haven't done anything wrong. Book of Proverbs says, the adulterous wipes her mouth and says, what? I didn't do anything. <laughs> People lie to themselves about their sins. And they can't, uh, consequently, they can't have real fellowship. Christianity is fellowship with God and with each other. It's not a private religion. It's our Father who art in heaven. Church is not a bunch of rituals and services that don't mean anything. It's fellowship. This afternoon, we're going to have koinonia. Today, we're having fellowship. I trust that your songs were prayers to God. We're fellowshipping in the light, right? But if you're lying, then you can't be. You can be here, but not be here. You can be in it, but not in it. You can be lonely in a church if you're in the dark. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Verse 9, about as simple as it gets. If you just say the same thing about your sins as God says, then he will forgive you and cleanse you. And the idea is, according to the pre previous verse, with the blood of Jesus. If we say we haven't sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. There's your darkness again. So, light. All right. Now, let me just get to the point, okay? What do I see in the light? When God's light shines, sooner or later it reveals that I as a person, an individual, have two major problems. One, sins. Sins. Things I do or things I've done that really do interrupt my fellowship with God, that really do deaden my soul, okay? That really do push me away from God. Sins. Anyone here relate to that? All right. To the two that couldn't, we'll pray for you afterwards. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm not keeping score. <laughs> What's my second problem? See, sooner or later, I become acquainted with my first problem, sins, but then sooner or later the second problem emerges, sin. Singular. What's the difference between sins and sin? Well, I do a lot of bad things and I hate that about myself. And sooner or later I realize, why do I do all so many bad things even though I hate them? And then I realize that my problem isn't just what I do, it's who I am. It's who I am. Now you're getting real. Now you're getting down to the brass tacks. I used to think, if only I wouldn't have done this. If only I wouldn't do that. If only I didn't go wrong here. If only I wouldn't have gone wrong there. Well, how far you got to go back? You couldn't go back far enough. It's sin. It's a principle working in us. It's something wrong with me constitutionally now sins are a problem too 
Sins are, are a problem. Sins will hurt your relationship with God and with other people. I mean, sin, look, here's a fundamental Bible verse, but learn it. The wages of sin is death. That's true. Sin will always kill. It will kill relationships. It will, and, and what is the lie the devil always tells? You can do this and it won't affect anything. You can do this secretly and no one will know and it won't affect anything. Your secret sins are your worst sins. They're the most dangerous. Look, it's a lie. Sin, the lie is that sin does not affect your relationship with God or others. That's a lie. The wages of sin is death. Sin is death. But thank God for the other half of that verse. The gift of God is life. God will give us something to counter the death, right? His life. Anyway, let me get back to the sins and sin. One is a uh, principle working in me, and the other are things that I do. And God offers a dual remedy. And according to the New Testament, and I'll explain how this works, the remedy for sins is the blood of Jesus. And the remedy for sin is the cross of Jesus. Now, this needs to be understood if you're going to go on, if you're going to make progress as a Christian. Look, if you keep on going with Christ, he will clean up your life. He will break the chains that used to hold you. He will, he, look, Christ sets people free. If you continue my word, Jesus said, you'll know the truth. The truth will make you free. Christ sets us free, but free of what? Free of ourselves. Free of our sins, free of who we are, free of the devil. I mean, Jesus sets us free. There is no way that Jesus won't set you free if you continue in him. The thing is, you've got to continue. And so there's a twofold remedy for sins and sin. The, the blood of Jesus and the cross of Jesus. Because the blood of Jesus, as I'll show you, is the answer for what I've done against God and against other people. And the cross of Jesus is the answer for who I am. Because the power of the cross is not just that Jesus died. The power of the cross is that anyone who believes in Jesus is allowed to die in Jesus and be born again. That's, that's what God's doing here. It's called the new birth, okay? I am a Randalls. I can't help but being a Randalls. I have all the traits of my earthly father. How am I ever going to stop being a Randalls? Because sometimes, if you ask the people at Prairie High, that's a big problem, all right? <laughs> well, if you're born into a family, there's only one way out. You got to die. You got to die. One of the best things I ever heard is that, did you know that when Jesus died, if you believe in Jesus, you died in him. You died with him. It's the co-death. And when Jesus rose from the dead, if you believe in Jesus, what you're believing into is the resurrection from the dead. You know, you get sick of saying, I did this, Lord, I'm sorry, I did that, 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 I'm sorry. You think, man, I've asked forgiveness for a thousand things. Well, that's designed to get you to see the deeper problem. Right. What is wrong with me? Okay. It's me. Now you're ready to die. Now you're ready to die and be born again. Anyway, sin is expressed in the Bible as disobedience to God. It creates a separation. Don't let anyone tell you any different. It's a literal hindrance to fellowship with the Holy God. Okay. And your conscience awakes. This is part of the problem of being a Christian. You get a new conscience. <laughs> and it's a pain because it's awake. It's awake. It hurts. Now, you could kill it again if you want. You could ignore it. Go to Romans chapter 3. Let me try and explain this the best way I can, because it's one of the best things I ever learned as a Christian. And I dedicate this to all the young and all the new Christians, and even the old Christians could, they could need, use a new lesson, all right, on an old thing, all right? You never outgrow this stuff, right? Okay, Romans 3, verse 23, he says, oh, uh, well, we may as well start in verse uh, 21. Okay, look. Uh, no, excuse me, 23 is where I'll start. All have sinned. 
How many believe that? <laughs> All have sinned. And literally what it says, are coming short up to this moment of the glory of God. Okay, now I know that that's true of me. I have sinned, and I don't like that. And I'm coming short up to this moment of the glory of God. Now, since I've become a Christian and my conscience became tender, there's things I know that I was forgiven of a long time ago, but when they come to my mind, I cringe. I say, God, I'm sorry. I just, I, I'm not going crazy. That's normal. That's how the Holy Spirit purifies us. He purifies our soul by dealing with us and showing us in, by degrees the depth and the enormity of sin. That's a very important lesson to get. That's why the, a lot of glad-handed churches and preaching is bad for people because it minimizes this. This is a very essential thing. All have sin and are coming short of the glory of God right up to this moment. In other words, I am not living the way God originally intended me to live. There is just no doubt. There's some motive. There's some thought. There's some flaws in my life right up to this moment what am I going to do but verse 24 is the counter to that verse 23 is what's real on this earth right now but verse 24 is what's equally real from heaven right now if all have sinned and are coming short of the glory of God verse 24 says all are being justified right up to this moment Okay, so I'm falling short up to this moment, but I'm being justified up to this moment. How? All are being justified as a gift. How many are glad for God's gifts? Could you do it yourself? <laughs> Only God could justify you. As a gift, he says, by his grace, through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Redemption means he purchased us. We enslaved ourselves by our sins. We put ourselves in the cosmic slave market. But Jesus came along and bought us out. He bought our freedom. What was the price? His blood. That's why it says in Revelation 1, 5, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. To him be glory. He purchased us by his blood Verse 25, through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God has put forth publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. So you know what your faith in Jesus really is, technically? Faith in Jesus becomes faith in his blood. Now let me explain this. Okay. The wages of sin is death. Every single human being deserves to die. And I don't mean just die physically. Die forever. Because we've sinned against a holy God. It's, it, we sinned against an infinite person. And therefore we have an infinite punishment over our head. The wages of sin is death. God demands a death for our sin. But if you die for your sin, then you will be ruined forever. So God makes a demand. I demand a death for sin, but then the same God that makes the demand provides what he demands. He says, I know you, I don't want you to die because you will, you'll be perished forever. His son steps forward into history and presents himself as a substitute for us. That's the meaning of the cross. The Romans did not murder Jesus, neither did the Jews. Jesus stepped forward. There's this awesome psalm that's a conversation between the Father and the Son from eternity past, Psalm 40. And Psalm 40, the Son says to the Father before he even came into the world, I know what you want and I know what you don't want. You don't want sacrifices of bulls and sheep and goats. I know what it'll take. And I know that you provided for me a body. I delight to do your will, God. The son said to the father, I'm willing. What did it take? Him coming into the world and him living a sinless life. He takes on his shoulders in, in, in Nazareth, Sproutsville, the perfect 
heavy, heavy, heavy will of the law of God. And he's the only person that ever fulfilled it perfectly. And then at the prime of his life, he offered himself as a sacrifice. The cross was the altar between heaven and earth. How fitting. And he poured out his life's blood. Because the blood has a value. The blood of Jesus. The problem is it's not a value set by man. It's the va- the, what counts is the value set by God. For it was God's righteousness that we offended. It was God's law that we broke. Therefore, it is God himself, the Father, who demanded life for life. And Jesus offered to God the only sinless human life. See, what is the meaning of the blood? It's the life that Jesus lived. And it was offered to God in exchange for our life. He, he, he poured out his blood. So that's what it means here in verse 25. Big word Sunday, right? Propitiation. You'll see it in the Bible. There's a lot of different words to describe what Jesus did because it's a cosmic event. I mean, it is infinite in its ramifications. But one of the words that's commonly used in the Bible is propitiation. What's that mean? A satisfaction offering. You have a debt that you owe to God, and you can't pay. You couldn't even pay the interest. And you could offer mountains of sheep, goats, bulls, whatever, good works, New Year's resolutions. You won't touch it. But this man, when he offered himself as a sacrifice in your place as a substitute, the Lord from heaven said, I am satisfied. It's like getting a bill back that says, paid in full. In fact, that's what Jesus said on the cross right before he died. Till I die, which means paid in full. Your debt between you and God has been canceled out. Why? Someone has paid the debt. Someone has redeemed us. Someone has offered something that the holy God could be satisfied with. That is, someone is Jesus, and that satisfaction is his sinless life poured out on a cross. This is so powerful and so holy that we can't even do justice to it. He says, who God displayed publicly. God put Jesus on the cross right out in front of everyone as a propitiation in his blood. A satisfaction offering. Now, how do we know God was satisfied with the offering of Jesus? Well, three days later, they went down to the tomb to finish embalming him. And guess what? The tomb was empty, the door was open, and two angels were sitting at either side where Jesus had lain. And they said, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He's not here, he's risen. This is the divine stamp on the offering that Jesus made for us. This is God's way of saying, yes, it worked. He paid the price. Your sins are canceled out. You can be forgiven. How many need forgiveness to say? Oh God, how I need forgiveness. It's, see, here's the thing. The blood of Jesus was shed primarily for God. Jesus died for God. What do I mean by that? God loves us. He made us. He wants to be with us. But he can never violate his own nature. And God's nature is holiness. People don't get that, see? See? That's why the Bible says the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Understanding is the ancient way of saying, get it. They don't get it because they don't know what holy is. God is holy. He can never, ever fellowship with unholy. So how is he going to fellowship with us? Okay. Someone has to pay a price. Someone has to make a way. What did Jesus say about himself? I am the way the truth, and the life. He's the way back to God. No one comes to the Father but by me. Jesus is the way. It's just so simple, right? I was so lost. Isn't that what we say about people that don't have faith? They're lost. There's a lost sheep. There's a lost coin. There's a lost son in three of Jesus' stories. And I was lost. I didn't know where I was going. I didn't know what was up or down. I was drowning in sin and in the world. 
And then Jesus came, and I heard his voice, not physically, but spiritually. And he called me, and he's calling you. He's calling everyone here. That's why we have this meeting right now. <laughs> I don't care how many or how few are here. If you're the only one, Jesus is talking to you. Jesus is calling you. He made the way, okay? He appeared to the disciples and ate bread and fish. Now, in, in six or seven accounts of the resurrection, it says Jesus ate in their presence. He ate fish and bread. Why doesn't he say he composed an esoteric poem or went into a trance or something like that? Because they want you to know that Jesus is really, really, really alive. When he put the fish in his mouth, you couldn't see it through his esophagus because he's alive. He's in the flesh and he's uh, in flesh and bone right now at the right hand of God the Father. Amen. And he's, what's he doing now? Well, he's a priest. Jesus is the only priest that can really bring men to God. That's really what priests, priests are. I mean, I used to be Catholic, and the priest would supposedly be your way to God. And, and they would bring God to you and you to God. And that would be a little disconcerting when you went to the Kolach Festival and saw your priest drunk out of his mind, okay? <laughs> I mean, I, I had to admit, I mean, he, he, he could relate to me. I mean, I too was drunk out of my mind, but, but he couldn't really relate to God. Okay. Because God's holy. What we need is someone that can relate to God and man. Now, angels can relate to God. If angels sin at all, they just get, dis they get damned. So the angels that didn't sin, I mean, they can understand holy, but they can't understand man. They don't know what it means to be a human being. What we need is someone that can bring the two together. A God-man or a man-God. And thank God there is such a person. Yes. But Jesus is the only unique son of God. He is the only person that will ever be like this. And that is that he is 100% man and 100% God. And we're going to celebrate the incarnation. <laughs> and what are we celebrating? I don't, I don't get people that don't like Christmas. I love Christmas. I don't like Santa Claus, and I don't like Burl Ives and Rudolph the Red Nose, okay? But I love the incarnation. And I don't care what month it happened. It could have happened in July, for all I know. But I love the fact that in the Western world, at least once a year... Songs like Silent Night, O Little Town of Bethlehem, Joy to the World, and O Come All Ye Faithful, just flow through the air, okay? How anyone couldn't like that, I don't know. What is it about that you couldn't like? And we preach the incarnation, which is the great fact of history, the mystery that we can't even comprehend ourselves, that God became a man. Now, why did God have to become a man? Because God cannot die. And man needed someone to come and die for him. So God became a man. And he came in the most backwater section of the world, a defeated country by the Romans, into a town, Nazareth, which literally means Sproutsville, Nowheresville. And he wasn't born in a slick hospital. Born in a barn, they probably had to shovel the crap aside and put a blanket down to lay him down. God became a man. Are you kidding me? He, he come down from heaven and come and save me? Why did God have to come down from heaven? Because we could never get up there. Ever. No one is good enough. Like I just read, all have sinned and are coming short of the glory of God. But anyway, let me. Get, I got off my. I was going to be as simple as possible, but I think this is very deep stuff. But I just pray to God, the Lord could just minister it to everyone right where they're at. The blood of Jesus Christ is primarily for God's sake, because God looks down on man and sees our sins, and He wants to bless us, but cannot be in in congruity with himself and blessed sinful evil men. But when people put their faith in Jesus and his blood, see, the blood is God's answer for sins. When people 
Then when God sees us, he sees us through the blood. Let me give you a great example. Passover. Ever hear of Passover? The Jewish feast. And it was instituted by Moses long before Jesus came. But Jesus fulfilled every one of the mysterious things about Passover. Basically on Passover, God's judgment was going to come on Egypt. How many know in a way we live in a spiritual Egypt and God's judgment's coming? He's going to judge this world in, in righteousness. So what he said to the children of Israel is, because they were sinners too. Children of Israel were sinners. They were, they were bad. And you can see that when you read Exodus and Numbers and <laughs> they're just as bad as anybody. But Moses was told, have every one of them take a lamb. One year old, bring it into your house for three days. Now, I just found out painfully that three days you can bond with an animal. <laughs> Shoot. <laughs> you, get, you get love in that animal, right? And then on one day, the whole nation is supposed to take their lamb and slit his throat. Bleed him out into a basin. Put him on a spit, like a cross, and roast him. And eat him. They said, make sure you don't break one bone of his body. Everyone wondered about that. Why does that make a difference? Well, when Jesus died on the cross, at the very moment that Israel was killing their Passover, Jesus was dying on the cross. Two days before, when the priests were inspecting the lambs for flaws, Jesus was undergoing a rigorous inspection by the, by the leaders of Israel, trying to find flaw with him. They couldn't. And when Jesus finally did die, the custom was for Roman soldiers to go along to crucifixes, there was three of them, and break their legs with a club. Why? Because the only way you could breathe is if you kicked off with your legs on the bottom part for the feet. So basically you drown. Crucifixion is drowning. And that's why you read Psalms where he says, the waters have come over my head. I mean, it's just drowning. So they broke the first thief's legs because he was still dying. They broke the second thief's legs. And they're almost going to break Jesus' legs. And then someone says, no, 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 he's already dead. So they didn't break his legs. But they didn't realize they were fulfilling the prophecy of Moses. that says, do not break a bone of the Passover lamb. Now, what do they do with the blood of the lamb? Put it in a basin, and everyone in the family has to go inside. Why? Because a plague is coming. The final plague, the judgment of God is coming on Egypt. So you go inside and the father has to go outside and paint something like a sign of the cross in blood on the door. And God says, when I see the blood, I'll pass over. Now, if that blood is not there, the firstborn of every household is going to be die of the plague. Every single household, the firstborn. So I can see that firstborn son saying, Dad, are you sure you got that cross on that door? But here's the thing. He couldn't go out and look at it. He just had to take it by faith. See, Jesus died for us. I take that by faith. He died. I've never seen it. We will see him. This is ironic. The apostle Peter says, you've never seen Jesus, but you love him. Now think about who said that. A man who spent three years with Jesus. But he's telling you and me, your faith is even greater than mine. You've never seen him, but you love him. You will see him. So the blood, who's, who's the blood for? God says, when I see the blood, I'll pass over. It's for God. Another thing that taught that in the Old Testament is the ritual on the Day of Atonement. One day of the year, this happened. And let me tell you, the whole nation just held their breath. Because on that day, that was the day their individual sins as a nation would be covered. Not really removed, covered. And there would be a sin offering offered Right in public, and there were crowds of people because they had services in the temple that would come every year to see that, okay? The offering was offered in public. The blood was drained out. Then the high priest went behind the curtain into the holy place and into the holy of holies. No one could see that. And he would sprinkle the blood seven times on this piece of furniture called the mercy seat. It covered the throne of God. 
The, the throne of God was a box overlaid with gold. The mercy seat was a solid gold lid with two cherubim with their wings that touched like that. And God said, I dwell between the cherubim. He literally sat on that throne. The high priest would take the blood and sprinkle it on the mercy seat seven times. And basically what that's telling God is that a transaction has occurred. An innocent sacrifice has been offered for the year. And your people's sins are covered, not removed, covered. They're covered for another year. And then the priest had to get out of there. Because he's in the presence of a holy God. If he does anything wrong, he dies. The whole nation's holding their breath. And when he comes back out of the curtain, it's like, whew. Our sins are covered for a year. Only covered. But listen, he can't sit down because it's never done. Next year, and the year after, and the year after, and the year after, and the year after. So he can't sit down. Now, the New Testament tells us that all that was was pointing to what Jesus would do. Now think about it. Jesus was crucified in public. But then a transaction occurred which no one could see but God and him. Because he too is our high priest. And the transaction says, there is something that happened on the people's behalf. I have given my life, my sinless life for them. I've poured out my life's blood. And it's not in the building on earth, but the building on earth is only a copy of the real one in heaven. Okay? So this thing happens behind closed doors because it's for the eyes of God. And God sees it. How do we know God saw it? Remember the priest came out from behind the curtain? Jesus came out from the grave. And as a matter of fact, one of the things that happened to Jesus has something to do with this. The veil that was around the holy place was torn in two from top to bottom. What that's saying is, this is the real deal. This is not the blood of goats and bulls. And this does not have to just last until next year. It's not just covering it up. This is real. Our sins aren't covered, they're remitted. You know what that means? Wiped out. The record is wiped out to anyone who confesses their sins. Anyone in communion with God, their sins are wiped out as though they never existed before in the sight of God. And one of the ways we know it is at the same time Jesus died on the cross, the veil in the temple was ripped in two and the way was opened. And the other thing is, okay, remember in the, in the earthly ritual, the priest could never sit down because it was never done. But what does the New Testament say three or four times? After he had by himself purged our sins, Jesus sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And he ever lives to make intercession for us. Jesus is beautiful. The plan of God is beautiful. In every way that you fall short, Jesus is there at the right hand of God. And anyone who comes to him on the basis of his finished work, his blood, is accepted by God no matter what they did. And will continue in communion with God no matter what they've done as long as they keep in the blood. God is the one that said, see Peter says, you're born again, not of corruptible things like silver and gold but of incorruptible by the precious blood of the Lamb who is without spot or blemish. It has to do with access to God himself. Every single Christian has this privilege because of Jesus' blood, that you have access to God. I mean, we don't think about it, but just the ability to pray and know that you're heard is radical. You couldn't even pray in the Old Testament. You had to go through a priesthood. And they'd have to do your praying for you. You can have your own walk with God. You could go to God today. You could go home today and nail down by your bed. And you could go right in. You say, in the name of Jesus, boom, you're right there in the holy place of God in heaven. And God will hear. And God will hear what we have to say. 
And if you've sinned and you feel defeated, and let's say you've sinned over and over again, you feel defeated. You say, I've sinned so many times since I've become a Christian. I don't even have the right. You know what? It's not about how you feel. It's his faithfulness and justice. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It just, it's just what gives us continual access to God. The book of Hebrews says, then you can have, you can have boldness, see, well, let me read it. Hebrews 10. And there's one other aspect I want to touch on before I close, okay? And that is that about in relation to the devil. Because there is a devil, and he does accuse people. He accuses them to God. He accuses them to each other. He accuses them to themselves. He, Hebrews chapter 10 Boy, did these passages ever help me back when I was coming out of the Catholic Church. Let's see, verse 19. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus. In the Old Testament, there was a tent inside of a tent inside of a tent. And the holy place was forbidden to everybody except priests. And the Holy of Holies was forbidden to everybody except the high priest. That's where God's throne was. You couldn't go in there. But in the New Testament, the veil is ripped. Jesus has died. No more animal sacrifices. Our sacrifice is Christ himself. It's already been offered. And what he's saying is you can have confidence to go right in to the holy place. The heavenly holy place. By, a new, by the blood of Jesus. By a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is his flesh. So the veil that was ripped corresponds to the body, the physical body of the man, Christ Jesus. When that veil was ripped, it was because he was ripped. What is he? He's the temple of God. Remember they said, you know, he said, destroy this temple. And I'll build it up again in three days. And they had no idea what he's talking about. That became one of his charges at his trial. He says he's going to wreck the temple. Well, he's talking about his body. He's the real temple of God. Because Jesus is the real location of God. Anyone who comes to God in Jesus is there. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, thank you, Jesus. Let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. The washing there with pure water is the baptism. He's referring to baptism right there. Once in a lifetime thing that you do when you're a believer. You know what you're doing. But the conscience, see the baptism is a once and for all cleansing, but the conscience is ongoing because... We have a conscience, and you've got to keep a good conscience. In fact, what is a conscience? A conscience is a compound word that means with knowledge. In other words, I have knowledge, and then I have another knowledge, a deeper knowledge. I know all kinds of things, but there's a part of me that knows what I've done against God. That's my conscience. Now, people, some, a lot of people these days have seared theirs. They've killed it. Godlessness kills the conscience. But when you get born again, the conscience comes back alive. How do you, what, okay, so I got this knowledge that I've done something displeasing to God. Okay, how can I get my conscience cleansed? Well, I do have this knowledge that I did something that's displeasing to God, and I can't deny that. But I have another knowledge from the gospel that someone else has done something effective to remove the barrier between me and God. That's the secret of a clean conscience. Jesus, I have sinned, but I know that you died for my sin to bring me to God. Christ died for sin once and for all to bring us to God. Now let me just say one more thing before I close. There's a beautiful verse in Revelation 12 that says they overcame the devil by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony. 
and because they love not their lives unto death. Now let me take a stab at a basic understanding of that. Three things, the blood of the lamb, that's what gives us victory over the devil. Why does that give us victory over the devil? Because the devil, the word devil is uh, accuser. That's what it means. Like say, uh, Satan, Satan is not a name, it's a title. Satan is a prosecuting attorney. Okay, Satan brings a case against us before the throne of God. Do you see what Bill did? Did you hear what he said to that person? He's bringing, he's always accusing. Okay. Now what's, the blood helps us overcome this. I'm not going to say I didn't do it. Agree with your adversary quickly. But what I am going to say is, Lord, I did sin, but I appealed to the blood of Jesus. And case dismissed. Okay. The way that say, the blood of Jesus helps us overcome Satan is it puts us back on God's side. He, he made us acceptable to God. It's amazing, right? And by the word of their testimony. Well, that, what, that's specific. I have to say the same thing that the blood says or that God says. That's the reason why you have to confess your sins. Not to a priest, not to a man, but to your high priest, Jesus. Say the same thing about him, he says. And they love not their lives to death. That has to do with self-justification. You can't overcome the devil if you're busy justifying yourself. You've got to just admit it. Agree with your adversary quickly while you're on the way with him. Now, I'd like to uh, pray right now. And uh, um, that I also want to invite everyone. We're going to have a time of fellowship and a, a meal that everyone's invited to participate in. And then we're going to have a koinonia afterwards. So please stick around for that. But Lord, I pray for anyone here that has not ever accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that has never been washed in the blood, that does not know this freedom, this cleansing, this righteousness which we speak of. I just pray that you'll bring each of us into the reality of it, the fullness of it, if there's anybody here in that position, I'd like to challenge you, if you want, to come forward right now and let me pray with you. There's something about not being ashamed of Jesus, just doing it in front of everyone. I urge you to do that, although don't do it unless you want to do it, unless you really believe. But if you believe what I'm saying and that's not been your experience yet, I want you to come forward. We want to pray for you before we close. Maybe Chris could lead us in a song. And while we sing that, then when that song's done, we're done. And I just ask people to help us set up. But whoever you are, if you are not right with God, if you have not been washed in the blood of Jesus, if you do not know the reality of what I'm talking about, I urge you to come forward, please.